So this morning we'll be in 1 Peter chapter 3. So if you turn your Bibles there, the, the title of the lesson is Godly Living. And I'm going to read, you feel free to follow along with me, the first six verses. You say, haven't we gone over this before? Well, we probably have. But we're going to uh, look at this this morning and then uh, we'll look at uh, what is said from verse seven and beyond next Sunday. So Peter says in first Peter, chapter three, verse one, wives in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word that they may be one without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment such as elaborate hairstyles and wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self and unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who would put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham, called him Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. So that's the text that we will be considering this morning. Now, Peter's already established in his letter that believers need to act as an example of Jesus in an unbelieving world. And like I've said many times, don't be surprised when the world acts like the world. The world's not going to act like God. The world's not going to uh, live out the words of, of Christ because they don't belong to Christ. So as Christians, we're not to be rebels against authority, but rather we're to work in it and or work within it and, and serve God. That's what we are to do. And Peter sort of brings that out. So this morning we address or I address or we think about what probably is the, the, the least popular teaching in all of Scripture, I would say, according to society. Right. So I'm teaching this because. This is what God says through the Apostle Peter. Although it flies in the face of societal norms, submission. If you think about it, it's often misunderstood, right? Wouldn't you agree with that? Submission is is often understood and submission of the wife to the husband even more so. That is not welcomed by a lot of people, right? There are some scriptures I want us to be tuned in to as we move through this lesson. Paul says in three different letters, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, he says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So that's the understanding that Paul has. Now, Ephesians chapter five, verse 24. And again, these uh, th this isn't the context. I'm not reading the entire context. And, and you can do that on your own if you'd like. But in Ephesians chapter five, verse 24. Now. As the church submits to Christ, so we're all in submission to Jesus, right? So also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. So this would be something that the Lord would say, that's a good thing. Now again, society doesn't like this. And a lot of times Christians don't like this. And it may be because 
some aren't understanding what is being said. It doesn't sound right. It, it sounds harsh. It sounds, well, that's not what it is. And as we go uh, beyond this sermon, as we continue through the letter of 1 Peter, we'll see. We'll see that. So in 1 Peter 3, 5, as we've read, for this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands. So it seems that Peter's not teaching a sort of a general submission of all women to all men, right? It doesn't seem that way, at least to me. I think that's being fair with the text. Submission is not being a doormat. It's not what submission is. Submission is not accepting abuse. That's not being submissive. That's not what Peter's talking about here. So the apparent purpose of, of what he is bringing out here is how, how, how should a Christian wife interact with an unbelieving husband? And that happens even today, right? So that's a good question. How should a wife behave if her husband is not a Christian? So in the first century, being submissive according to the, the cultural norms that they had was to save the marriage, quite possibly, and even possibly to save her own life, being submissive. And, and this submission wasn't a go ahead to just adopt whatever the husband, the unbelieving spouse said or, or did. And, I mean, if the husband worshiped a pagan God, the, the believing wife, the Christian wife was not to go all in with that but just because her husband was believing that and worshiping some kind of idol or she's not to follow him in ungodly behavior. That's not what Peter's talking about. It's not what God is, is interested in. But he, he, God is interested in protecting the wife. Okay, you have to remember the setting in which this was written, the people to whom this was written. And we get the benefit of reading this and understanding. So as I said a uh, week before last, I believe that God is not just interested in uh, women as far as uh, protecting them he is he is saying in scripture when he created eve as adam's helper that's not a demeaning thing very rarely is a human being called helper but eve was and god is the one that's called helper to his people he is the one and so it's an honor or it would be an honor to be called helper for god to call you a helper that's the way God sees that, I believe. Now, society wouldn't see it that way. But we're talking about what Peter's writing to Christians that are scattered. And they need this information. So in the first century, when a man became a Christian, he typically would bring his entire family with him. And we see this in Acts chapter 16, verses 29 through 34. It's the story of the, or the account of the Philippian jailer. You remember his entire family came. And that was what I'm told would be the norm. The husband believes everybody's believing. And in contrast to that, in that day and time, when a, when a wife became a Christian, she would become a Christian without her family following her. Does that make sense? You say, I don't like that. Well, that was the culture of the day. This is, this is the, the writing of, of, of uh, Peter. And he understands this. Roman law, he would have understood this. In, in Roman law, the husband or the father had absolute authority absolute authority over all the members of his family. Absolute authority. So a believing wife demanding her rights as a free woman 
in Christ would endanger her marriage and quite possibly her own life. You see that? So you can sort of begin to see what God is doing in protecting the wives that had unbelieving spouses. So this is, I believe, done for her protection. She should live her new faith quietly and respectfully. Again, society would say, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. And maybe even some Christians may say, I don't like that. But hang on. God's not finished yet. All right. They are to be engaged with this unbelieving husband. The wife is to be engaged, the believing wife to the unbelieving husband in a way to win him over without words. Well, that hardly sounds right. Right? How do you do that? I, I would think you would need to use a lot of words. Many, many words. And I've had people ask me. Especially when I've preached uh, meetings somewhere and in other states. And say, my husband isn't a, a believer. And. I've been telling him this and I've been I've been saying this and I've been trying to drive this point home. And, and my response is, well, maybe you should just stop all that. Is it working well for you? No, it's not. He's digging his heels in and this has become a bitter battle. And I said, I think you should stop that. See, that's not expected, is it? No, you should keep going. I mean, if he doesn't understand, hit him harder with this verse or that verse. Right. Not physically, but yeah. But I would say what Peter says. Try winning. Try winning him over with your behavior. So believing wife, unbelieving husband. God isn't suggesting doing nothing in this case. Instead, he's saying be godly. Be like Jesus in the setting. So the natural inclination would be to preach more, to say more to the unbelieving husband, right? And God instructs to speak louder than words. Action. You've heard that saying before. Action speaks louder than words, right? It does. So what is the action that she should take upon her to sort of lay out before her husband as she lives with him in this marriage. It is godly behavior. It is reverence. It is purity. It's what the scripture says. So show the self-giving love that Jesus showed the church. So you just ask yourself, if you would be in this setting, you would just ask yourself, what has Jesus done for me? I mean, we just took the Lord's Supper. Thank you, Stephen, for serving us. Appreciate that. We just took the Lord's Supper. And what is that about? That's reminding us of what Jesus has done. True? It is, isn't it? And so we need to be like that. We need to be like Jesus and serve like him. Love as Jesus loved. And he shows us that. So the goal is to win the husband over to Christ, not to rage against the machine. You know, that's not the goal. So you may win a little battle, but lose the war. And that's a war. Well, that's not a war, is it? Well, some people sort of take it on as, as such, but it's not really. God is interested in this unbelieving husband <clears throat> just as much as he is the believing wife. And so how do you how do you help the husband, the unbelieving husband, believe it's by being like Jesus? First Corinthians, chapter nine, verse 19. This is Paul's example. And he says this about himself. And I love this about him. And I love this verse because of what it says. First Corinthians nine, 19. 
though I am free and I belong to no one. I have made myself a slave to everyone. I've made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. So be like Paul. Be like God. Be like Jesus in this setting. That's what Peter is saying to them to help the situation. I, I recall a, a, a listening to a preacher one time talk about a friend of his. And the friend, uh, well, he knew this couple, I'll say, friends of, of, to both of them. But so the, the husband was unbelieving and he was belligerent and he was hard to live with. And he was just a, 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 a nasty individual from what this preacher was saying. And the wife became a believer in Jesus. And so what does she do? She goes to the assembly she and he would just he would just sort of rage against that and be against that and try to discourage her in every way that he could so she had this thought reading this text and and thinking about how she should be and so what she decided to do was get on the floor and she just laid in the living room floor, just laid out in the floor and prayed silently for her husband. Well, he comes downstairs the first morning she's doing this and he's thinking she had fallen down the stairs. And so he goes to, you know, see what's going on. And and finally, she has to tell him, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm OK. But what are you doing? You know. So finally, she tells him, I'm praying for you, praying for me. Yeah, I'm praying for you. And then he proceeds to, you know, tear into her with his words, with his discouragement. And she does this day after day. He comes down the steps and there she is lying in the living room floor. Praying. And he's mad at her and he yells at her. And he tries to make things difficult for her. She keeps it up. She keeps doing this day after day after day after day after day. And do you know what? He finally became a believer. How does that work? Well, God gives some great instruction here, doesn't he? Not saying you have to lay out in the living room floor and pray. But that's just an example. So let's focus for just the last few moments here. What, what's being addressed is where, how should a believing wife focus her attention? Where should the attention be? So the point would be, to adjust the focus on God and his wishes, wishes for these kinds of situations. So his focus would be for the wife. It would be for her to focus on the inward beauty more than the outward. Now, Peter's not calling for believing wives to just just sort of chuck it all and, and say, no, I'm not. You know, he's not saying go without deodorant or wear dresses made of feed sacks. He's not saying that. It's not what he's saying. Use deodorant, please. All right. God is addressing the attitude of, of, of what makes you beautiful, isn't he? What really makes you beautiful? It's not the external attractance. And this word adorning carries with it this idea of trying to attract attention to yourself, right? So God is sort of refocusing. He's 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 helping them reimagine what it is, what it should be. 
the, the culture of the day obviously was was to do what Peter's saying that these women would do in order to attract attention, attract someone. But it's not it's not this these external attractants, but internal beauty. That's what truly matters. And that's what Peter's is sort of bringing out here this this idea or this thought. So it's not wrong to fix your hair. Wives, it's not wrong to fix your hair. It's not wrong to wear jewelry. It's not wrong to wear clothes. It's wrong to place your faith and your trust in them over God in those things, right? Peter doesn't get hyper focused with jewelry and and like we do, we we as human beings, we like to go to extremes. I don't know why. But we do. And so we can hyper focus on those things. Oh, well, then who determines what jewelry is too much? Is 10 karat gold OK over, you know, 18 karat gold? Well, we can't have that in here, right? I mean, who gets to decide that? See, that's not the focus. The real focus is the internal beauty. And that's what that's what he's bringing out here. That's what he wants them to see. It's what he wants us to see. So Peter brings up the example of Sarah in the Old Testament. In reference to um, being adorned with a gentle and quiet spirit. And from what I've read, uh, Sarah was supposed to have been a very beautiful woman. And so Sarah is sort of the example here that he puts out. Now, he does mention women in the Old Testament times, right? There are lots of other examples, but he just picks this one. And he sort of highlights Sarah. Proverbs 31, 30 says this charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And that's true, isn't it? So Sarah had a had a continuing pattern of submitting to the authority that God had established. She, she wasn't fighting against that. That was sort of the way that she lived, although well, we know that she was submissive to her husband, Abraham. And there are a few examples in Scripture where you could say, well, she disobeyed or she didn't do. Um, well, disobeyed might be the right word. And you can look these up. I'm not going to read them. Genesis 16 verses 2 verse 6. Genesis 18 verse 15. But Sarah's submission wasn't that of a slave. It wasn't. So as Abraham was considered the father of the Jewish nation, Sarah was considered the mother of that nation. So Isaiah chapter 51 verse 2 says, look at Abraham. This is in Isaiah. Look at Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who gave you birth. When I called him, he was only one man, and I blessed him and made him many. Galatians chapter 4, Paul talks about this, uh, this same thing. Abraham and, and Sarah talks about what God has done, what he's brought about. Verses 22 through 26, Paul says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, and we know this, one by the slave woman, Hagar, and one other by the free woman. That would be his wife, Sarah, right? His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of divine promise. Now you remember, whose idea was it to bring Hagar into the picture? Yeah. God must have meant this. And so, no, God meant this. And so Sarah goes along with this. 
And she does have a son. Do you remember her laughing about this? <laughs> These things are being taken figuratively, Paul says in Galatians 4. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the but the Jerusalem that is above is free and she is our mother. So Sarah is an example of putting faith in God and trusting God in the moment, in the situation. Although you could say, well, she had some road bumps. Let's, she's had some bumps in the road there. Uh, she did. In what she was thinking. And as human beings, we do that, right? But we let God adjust our focus. We let God help us see. So women who make these same choices and refuse to give in to th their fears about being protected or provided for or personal worth or maybe what they feel they deserve. These type of women become Sarah's children by being like her, you see. And this is why Peter brings this up. So those who follow her example, the example of Sarah, also receive honor, attaining an unfading beauty. And they will succeed. You will succeed in pleasing God. So. This is not the way the world sees it. But this is the way God sees things. And what God is after is for families to be in his son. For us to be together. And so he's doing what he can do to help us see how to get there. So I hope this is helpful. We'll continue to move through 1 Peter. And we'll continue to see the things that we see next week. We'll talk um, about husbands and, and our role in all of this. So this morning, if you need to put Christ on in baptism, please, please consider him this morning. If you need us to pray for you, with you about anything, we would love to do that. What I want to ask you to do is to step forward if that's your desire. Uh, a shepherd will greet you at the front and he'll ask you why you've come and you can let him know. We're going to stand and sing at this moment and that's your cue to come.